two together, one with another, to worship him, to bring of our supply, amen, and to make sure that we are fed in this house. One of the things Pastor G and I are very strong about is being um, fed well in the word of God, understanding the word of God, understanding the promises of God. You know, we have a little saying that we utilize. We've utilized it for years, and I know as we build and as we continue here, we'll continue to use it. it it's equipped for life. And so that's what Pastor G and I desire. We desire to see a people of God that are equipped for life, that know how to do life. Amen. How many of you know before you got born again, or e and even after you got born again for a while, you didn't quite know how to do life? But as the word came and the word began to change you, the word begins not only to build your house, but then God brings us corporately together where we build him a house. Amen. And so how do we build our house? Proverbs chapter 24, verses 3 and 4 tells us, it says, Through wisdom, a house is built, and by understanding, it is established. By knowledge, the rooms are filled with precious and pleasant riches. And so we see here that wisdom really is applied knowledge. It's learning what the Word says and then putting it into practice in our lives. So we know that the Word of God is full of knowledge. It's full of instructions to us. We must always remember that the Word of God instructs us. It doesn't give us suggestions. So often I think as believers, we read it and we think, well, the Lord's kind of suggesting this, but I'm not too sure if I really like that. You know, I always say, if we start to pencil out the things in the Bible that we don't like, we won't have many pages left. You know, there, there are many that approach it that way, but I want us to learn how to approach the Word and read it as, Father, these are instructions you're giving me. These are instructions for my benefit. These are instructions that help me. These are instructions that help me build not only my house, but help me build this house corporately that you've called us to build. Amen. And so God will give us the wisdom that we need to build the house that he's calling us to build. And so we never build according to circumstances. Amen. Never, ever. It's so tempting. It's so tempting to look at what you have in your hand and say, well, I only have X, Y, Z, so I'm not going to do A, B, C. But the Lord never wants to look at what we have in our hand. He wants us to open our ears and hear by the Spirit. He wants us to clearly hear. That is how wisdom helps us build what God wants built. So that wisdom is saying, all right, I go to the Word of God, and I'm not approaching it from what suits me. I'm approaching it from what suits the Lord, what He is calling me to do. And so He gives us instructions. And so, you know, you and I, we need to understand that it is a privilege to participate in the plan of God. So we get corporately to come together to participate in the plan of God. And one of the ways that we participate, there are many ways we participate with our time, our talent, but also with our treasure. So one of the ways we participate is with our treasure. And so the Bible is saying to us, wisdom builds a house. A wise woman builds or a wise believer builds, but a foolish one tears it down. So what is foolishness? Foolishness is saying, I don't know if I really believe everything that the Word of God says, and I'm just going to do my own thing anyway and hope for the best. But you know that never works. We have to hear what God is saying to us. We have to listen to the leading of His voice. We have to become sensitive to what it is that He desires for us to do in this place. Amen? So I always say that we need to consistently hear the instruction of the Lord. Why? Because our giving even requires planning. It requires planning. I know for Pastor Jerry and I, when paycheck time comes, we don't go and pay everything else off and then see what we have left over to the Lord. We plan it so we know that this belongs to the Lord. This is not for anything else. Listen, there's a temptation to go, oh, well, God will understand. No, no, no. The Lord wants you to build a house and not tear it down with your own hands. Amen. I know I have so many testimonies and stories of people who decided to do their own thing and all the things that went wrong. And they learned painful lessons. Amen. And so we need to hear the instruction of the Lord. And then we need to follow those instructions. We need to make sure that we are wise people. Wisdom, applied knowledge. The word says to me, I must bring of my tithes and my offerings into 
the house of the Lord. That is instruction. It's wise instruction. It's God's financial plan. Did you know God has a financial plan? And his financial plan don't look like our financial plan. Amen? And so it takes wise planning. So you set it aside for the Lord, and then you listen. Is there anything extra that the Lord wants you to do? See, because I think sometimes we do our bit and we think we're done. But are we really listening? There have been times when I was sharing with somebody the other day. There was something that happened with me last year at one of the conferences that I had a paycheck come in and the Lord said, put it all in. You see, now my flesh wants to say, but I've set this aside for you, Lord. This is, this is yours. This is mine. But then the Lord said, put it all in. So now I have a choice. Do I obey God or do I live by my own means? And you see, if I don't listen to the Father, I don't receive the benefit of what he wants to pour into my life. So it's always much wiser to allow wisdom to flow in our lives and allow the word of God to work in us and do what we want to do. So if you have your offering in your hand, let's take it before the Lord. Father, we come in the mighty name of Jesus. Again, such a privilege, Father, to be a part of what you're doing in this place, to be a part of what you're doing in this house. Father, we desire to be those wise, wise people that build. And we build according to your word, Father that you would be glorified. Father, I thank you that as we bring of our substance tonight, that we are making sure that what you desire is manifested in this place. We thank you for your goodness and your faithfulness towards us, Father God. And we thank you that we say that our lives are subjected and submitted to you in every way. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Thank you, ushers. You can take up the offering. I'm going to hand to Pastor G. That's my grandson applauding his granny for such a good job. <laughs> and she do a good job with offering, eh? Amen. Amen. Yeah, you can also applaud. And she does such a good job. Amen. Amen. You can see I taught her well. <laughs> I'm going to get into trouble, eh? <laughs> oh, big time trouble. Amen. Thank you, guys. Huh? <laughs> anyway. I uh, just thinking about this morning, I kind of rattled some cages this morning. That was good because, you know, rattling cages means it's time that we got to change. <laughs> Things need to change. You know, you can't keep doing the same old, same old and expect a different result. Yeah, if you're not happy with the results you're getting, it re requires you to change some things. And, uh, and uh, so if you're looking for a title tonight, the title is The Need for Change. We need it. It's part of our DNA. It's part of our very uh, essence of who we are, that God desires for us to continually change. So, Father, we thank you right now for your precious Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit. Bring revelation and understanding. Come teach us, guide us, and instruct us as the Father created us and requires of us to bring and be fruitful in our life. Help us tonight once again to tap into that revelation knowledge that brings the change, that uh, 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 changes the way we do life, that glorifies the work of the Son in us. And we give you all the praise and honor in Jesus' name, and we thank you, Lord. Tonight will be a night for change in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, we, we were created for change, yet most people, 80 to 90 percent, don't like change. They try to avoid it. I wrote down, and some are simply you know, thrust into change and, and go resisting into change. They go hollering into change, you know. Um, uh, just, when you, just when you're comfortable, God comes and creates discomfort. N not, not, because, not because he doesn't like you, but because he wants to grow you. How many of you know that God wants to grow you? So, you know, I, Michelle and I, you know, the three years we couldn't travel, we were stuck here, and uh, we got comfortable and now my three grandsons are visiting, and I've now been thrust into change. And some goes, some goes <laughs> willingly, and some goes resistingly. But I, but I love my grandsons. I love you know uh, Simeon, Seth, and Judah, 
And they're good for me. How many of you know they're good for you? That's why God gives us grandchildren, because they're good for us. Am I right, Deborah? They come and they kind of wind you up and, <laughs> and they require things from you. So it's all good and, and change is good. And so that's where we're going uh, in change, you know, uh, with tonight. So Romans 12, what does Romans 12 say? I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your... So in other words, reasonable. You should be able to do it. And then he says, and do not be... Conform to the world. So we can take that and say, don't be conformed to the way you do things. But be transformed with the renewing of your mind. What is the good, a perfect and acceptable will of God? And so God wants her to bring us into a position that we grow. And as we grow, because the whole Genesis, if we look at Genesis, the whole Genesis account is a challenge to us to grow. When, when God created the heavens and earth, how many of you know that when He created the heavens and earth, the earth was without form and void. And then God began to bring change. Didn't He say? And He separated the light from the darkness. In other words, He separated the chaos from the order. Because darkness was always involves around chaos. Jesus came to expose the work of darkness in our lives, the chaos in our life. Because whenever we become, whenever we become comfortable with where we are, invariably, if we keep going the same way, it leads to chaos. Hello. That's why he constantly brings that change, and so he brings light. Light means order. One of the things we were saying this morning, because one of the things we do in our house is that first thing we do when we, when we you know, are ready to uh, do our day after I've done my devotions, I come and we make our bed. You know, that's the first bit of order. And I said, you know, when I was, and Michelle said, when, when she used to grow up, she never used to make her bed until she married me. Do you understand? But where did I learn it? I learned that when I was, went into the police college. It, it was, we were conscripted in, in South Africa, we were conscripted in, and you had to go to do, either do two years of army or five years in the police force. I chose to do five years in the police force because it gave me more freedom, and I liked the sense of adventure. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but one thing they taught us right in the beginning is if you're going to be successful, there must be order in your life. Amen. And so that was the first lot of change that came into my life was that we needed to learn how to make a bed and that the corner of your bed had to be absolutely square. And we used to take two books and we used to rub it like that. And so when the commandant used to come in and have a, a commandant, uh, captain, yeah, when he used to come in, if he didn't like your bed, he'd just tip it over. <laughs> and that means you've got to make it again. And, and until you get it right, he keeps tipping it over. And I mean, that's a lot of growth in there. Do you make your bed in the morning? No, don't answer that question. <laughs> Amen. That's the first discipline, and that's how you get. So right in the beginning, we see that God, out of the chaos, He begins to create order. He separates the night from the day. He brings order into the situation, and then He begins to bring the other things that will cause the earth to flourish. And then he puts the plants, and then he puts the animals, and then he puts different things. And then lastly, he needs somebody to govern it. So he created you and me. He says, I need you to govern the earth. And so, but in governing the earth, he notice what he says. He says, I want you to be fruitful, multiply, have dominion, and subdue. So our responsibility is to take control of our environment, but not just to hold it captive, but to flourish in that environment. But if we're not willing to learn, if we're not willing to take those things and apply it into our life, eventually, you know, one thing, <clears throat> one thing about gardening, do I have any gardeners here? It's amazing how the weeds find your garden. Do you understand? And if you're not weeding that little sucker, eventually the weed takes over your, your garden. Do you understand? And so forever, you know, I'm out there and I'm, and I'm digging up the weeds because I want my, I am in control of my garden, not the weeds, but the weeds will come. You know, when the rain comes and things come, the seeds come, and then they're there. But you are going to need to subdue it. 
Now, you can let it run, and, and it can eventually become chaotic out there. Am I? Am I right? And so if you want to produce, if you want the beauty, if you want the, 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 the fruit that you want to grow or the vegetables that you want to grow, you've got to constantly go in there and bring about the necessary change so that those things can thrive in the environment that they're in. Amen. But it's up to you. You can just leave it and just say, happy birthday, let it just, you know, I like their own natural <laughs> in my environment, you know. And just be chaotic, and then you see the ivy growing up the wall, and you think, where did you come from? <laughs> well, you know, he says, I've got to cover your shame, because you won't take control of the house. I'm covering your shame. I'm going to cover with a lot of green stuff so nobody can see. Hello? Okay, I'm not going to go down that anyway. <laughs> so, <clears throat> so we see that in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and we understand that. So... The, the, so the first thing, yeah, if you're making notes, you can write this down. The first thing you need to understand, change is a gift from God. It's a gift. Don't see it as something that messes with your life. It's an absolute gift, change, environment gift. And, and if you look throughout, throughout the Word of God, whenever God wants to improve somebody's life, He takes them and He changes their environment. Sends you to another continent. <laughs> Do you understand? He changes. <laughs> he right. He changes your environment. Why? Because he wants he wants to do certain things in your life to empower you and to bless you and to cause you. Now, as long as you stay where you are, you become comfortable in the situation. Nothing's going to change. And so, by by creating change, we create a greater dependence and a greater resilience for the things that are going on around us. And then we, we push in and we bring a change in our environment. Amen? Okay. I mean, we went on holiday. Uh, it wasn't on holiday. We went to do ministry in Africa. Just recently, we went and we flew in there and we hired this... I don't know what you call them. What was it? A, a bed and breakfast? Not a bed and breakfast. Like a time, not a timeshare. It was like a condo thing. And we walked in there, and I began to switch on the lights, and I couldn't believe how shocking the lights were. And I said, I am not going to spend a week in here in semi-darkness. I mean, and I got photographs to, to, to show you. I got photographs. And so what I did is I, I went out and I bought, 11, that's how many bulbs it needed, globes it needed. It needed 11 so we could find our way around the apartment. <laughs> how can people live like that? And then even rent it out and think you're not going to get a, a good report when, 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 when people say, well, what did you think of our apartment? I said, firstly, you know, I had to find it in the dark. <laughs> you understand? And so for me, for me, if I'm going to spend time there, I'm going to change that environment. And that's what exactly what I did. I changed the environment, and once it was where I was happy, I was happy. People say, well, you paid so much money for it. Why did you get them to do it? I, I could still be waiting for them to come and do it. Do <laughs> you understand? So I take control. I do. It's the same thing. When I walk into a toilet, I don't know where it is, and I see things out of order, I said, if I'm going to go and sit down here, if I'm going to go and, and do my business in this toilet, I'm going to do it comfortably. So then I clean up the place. Yeah. Amen. I know some of you will sit on the seat, stand on the seat. Anyway, just, <laughs> we won't go down there. We just leave that alone. <clears throat> so... <clears throat> God changes a gift from God, and He wants to see us fulfill our potential in His image and likeness. So that's why He creates change, because within God, there is that ability to create an environment of change. He meant He created heaven and earth. Okay, all right, so you see. So Adam's purpose was to tend and keep the garden. That was his purpose. Amen? That was his purpose, to tend and keep the garden. So Adam was created in a way to learn how to manage. You see, a lot of times people say, well, you know, now that I'm a believer, you know, I don't believe, you know, God will supply my every need. No, you're going to go and have to work, sucker, to get the money to supply your every need. Yeah. 
Because God created work. It was in Eden. Adam was a gardener. Okay. All right. Well, that went down well. Huh? <laughs> Second thing. So change is a gift from God. Say it's a gift. I accept change. I don't resist change. I take it. I embrace it. I apply it to my life. And I'm excited about it. There you go. All right. So second thing. Change requires growth. In other words, to discover, to improve, to create, to build, to make better. In other words, tame our environment and improve uh, and improve its potential. You see, where, where Abraham was, he was not thriving. God had to take him and move him out of that place of where his comfort was to bring him in a place where he could thrive. Yeah? And, and we saw we were talking about that this morning in Genesis chapter 12. And says, and God said, move out of your country, move out of your family. In other words, you, sometimes you've got to break the areas or break the, the sense of your comfort, where your comfort zone is. This is my comfort zone. A little bit. Michelle has certain things in her comfort zone. Don't mess with her comfort zone and don't touch her cups. So anytime we have guests in our house, the first thing I do is I take them to God. I say, you see these cups here? If you love your life. <laughs> don't touch those cups. Amen. I said, you can break every other cup in now. You break that one. <laughs> I'm leaving home. You're on your own here. Yeah. Anyway. So, so Abram had to leave where he was to go and grow. Now, listen, if we just, let me just go back a little bit to Genesis uh, chapter 2. And it says, um, when, God, when God created man, he formed him out of the dust of the earth, right? In Genesis 2 verse 7, he formed him, and then he breathed into him, and then man became a living soul. That's a learning, experiencing, growing that's our children. Our children are born into our life and then we bring them and we grow them into the fullness of their potential because that's our responsibility. Abraham raised Isaac, he gave him a job, uh, he gave him a faith, taught him his faith, gave him a job and then found him a wife. And then let him do that. Are you going to find him a wife? Okay, good. We'll find him a good one. But first make sure, first make sure he's got a job. Yeah, anyway, so, <laughs> so, and those are important things that if we're going to raise our children. So we raise them to know how to speak to God, right? How to take care of themselves, yes? And then how to find a lifelong partner who is going to work with them and grow with them in the things that God has. Be fruitful, multiply, have dominion. Amen? Okay. So change requires us to grow. We see that in Abraham. Uh, and that's, here's the third thing. Change requires facing reality. Change requires facing reality. In other words, most people hide from their reality. They almost ignore it. How many of you know that, you know, um, when, when you spill something on your carpet and it leaves a stain? Eventually, you create a blind spot to the stain. Yeah. You know what you're doing? You're hiding your reality. There is a stain on the carpet. And what you do is you put another little carpet, a little mat over it so that you can't see it. And that's what we tend to do with everything in life. We put a little thing over it so we don't. So why? Because we're not willing to face our reality. Our reality is the carpet is ruined and we need to change it. But we don't want to change it because it's going to cost money. Oh, <laughs> shall I go home now? <laughs> Do you understand? And it's like a lot of things in life. We, we, we go and we put things over it and we hide it so that we don't have to confront it and we don't have to deal with it. Yeah. And those are different things. In, everybody's got a different thing in their life that they are challenged with. And so until you're willing to face a reality, you see Noah had to face reality, his reality. Look at this in in Genesis chapter 6. I think it's Genesis chapter 6, yeah. Genesis 
Let me just pick it up. What did I have here? Verse 11. And said, it says here, Now the earth was corrupt in the sight of God, and the earth was filled with violence. And God looked at the earth, and behold, it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted their way upon the earth. Then God said to Noah, The end of the flesh has come before me, and the earth is filled with violence because of them. And behold, I'm about to store it, destroy it. Make for yourself an ark or go for wood, and you shall make the ark, the rooms, and you shall cover it inside and out. And this is how you shall make it. In other words, God, out of all the people, only one person was willing to face their reality. Things were out of order. It's amazing how many people will sit in situations where there are things out of order and hide from the reality of it. They will, they will hide from the abuse. They will hide from it. They will cover those things that they think is, a, is, a, is well, you know, I, I don't want to do this. Or, or you know, what will people say? Or, and they hide from their reality. You've got to confront your reality. This is you, you cannot change if you're not willing to confront your reality. And that change requires us facing reality. It takes courage. You know, most people hide from their reality, hoping it will go away. Look in the mirror. You are the biggest stumbling block to your change. Hello? Yeah, you're the biggest stumbling block. Face your reality. You know, one of the things, uh, all of us, reality is, all of us are growing older. Yeah. Amen? So in the reality is, if I'm growing older, then there are certain things that maybe I could do 20 years ago that I cannot do today. Hello. You understand? There are certain, now, it's not, it's, not to say, it's not to say it's a bad thing getting old. Because with getting old, you get wisdom. And when you get wisdom, the purpose of the wisdom to impart it into other people's life and teach them. Now, listen, now, Sonny, you know, I've been doing this for 40 years. And I know, and listen, if you're not willing to face your, your reality, this and this and this is going to happen to you. Yeah, right. Boom. Now you help others find their reality and willingness to change. Yeah. You understand? And so if you're not willing to face your reality, you, you're not going to be able, but it takes courage. Yeah. How many of you know it takes courage to face the things, and, and, and especially when it comes to our own spiritual growth. Yeah. You've got to look at your spiritual growth and say, I am not happy where I'm finding myself today. I the amount of people that I say, oh, you know, I, sh I should really pray more. And why aren't you? I, I, I should really read my Bible. And why aren't you? You know, I've always wanted to go to Bible school. So what's stopping you? Okay. That went down like a... You understand, we make these excuses. Well, you know, I've got a family and I've got people and I've got this and I've got that and we make every other excuse why we shouldn't change when instead of just take the reality. When God said for us to move from Africa to the UK, I had to face the reality. This was going to be a major upheaval. The first person I have to convince that it's a good idea is my wife. And thankfully she heard the Lord because, you know, but I had, to, I had to assure her. I, you know, we had a Bible school student. He had this a wonderful idea that he was going to go to Papua New Guinea and he was going to go save the world. But you know what? He wasn't even taking care of his wife and finding provision for his wife. His wife says, I feel insecure about going on to the mission field with you. So eventually, she didn't. And they divorced. And I kept saying to him, I said, don't you understand, until you build that sense of security in your wife to know that you will take care of her when you go to Papua New Guinea. She ain't going nowhere with you, buddy. Do you understand? And so I had to build that reality. I had to face the reality. This is going to be a major change. I got to convince not only my wife, but my children that we're going to go over there and that God is going to provide for us. Now, I have the revelation what God was going to do, and I pray that she would have the revelation. She had the revelation, and, the, and of course, the kids went with us because they had no option. <laughs> well, the older two we gave. The other two, they had no option because we were responsible. 
the, those, Savannah and, and um, Ralph had no option. They had to go because they were still underage. But the other two were slightly older. But we gave them an opportunity to face their reality. Yeah. <laughs> and say, this is, this is going to be changed. You're going to have to leave all your friends and everybody behind. And you're going to go to a country. And, and by the way, Daddy doesn't know where we're going. <laughs> I just know the one leading me. Or where are we going to stay? I don't know, but God said he's going to give us a home. It's going to be fully furnished, and it's going to be okay. You know? And they all, yeah, oh, I'd love to see that in the family and everybody else. But if you, if, you know, we could have still been speculating back in Africa about everything. And then we would have not experienced the joy of uh, fulfilling our purpose and our potential in going where God takes it. But it's uncomfortable. How many of you know? Living out of a suitcase is uncomfortable. Living with the uncertainty of where the next, next place is going to be can be uncomfortable. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. But the one thing that you've got to be comfortable in is you've got to be comfortable in your relationship with God. Yeah. Do you understand? So that was the only thing that I could draw on even that time, and I remember, I remember sitting there, and, we, and you see your bank balance going ding, 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 <laughs> empty. And so eventually, I, you know, I started getting into a little bit of a panic mode. You know, I've got to go find a job. I've got to feed my family, you know, because my family is dependent upon me. I said, I've got to go feed my family. You know, I was thinking of getting my guitar and going into the middle of Bristol and busking. You know, and getting, and then, and then I, did, I started sending work applications in. And so my daughter came, my daughter came to me and she said, Dad, what are you doing? I said, no, I'm, you know, I'm just, um, I'm applying for jobs. She said, what did God tell you to do? He said, he told me to come and do the ministry here. And he says, so why are you applying for a job? Then did God speak to you or didn't he? You know, it's, out of the mouth of babes, sometimes you get a slap up the ear. Hello? And that was a slap up the ear. Bang! And I, I shut down, I, I tore up all the applications, and you just trusted God. And it was amazing each month how God did and what God took care of us. Amen? But it's that knowing, that sense, and that's why change sometimes is, is very difficult in your life because it requires you a total dependence upon God. Okay. And, and by the way, by the way, let's... Let's just talk about Noah for a minute. The reality of Noah, up until the time of Noah started building the ark, there was no rain. There was no rain because the earth was covered by a dome and, and the mist used to come up and water the things. So rain was, and God says, you know, there's going to rain for 40 days and 49. Huh? What's rain? I'm going to flood the earth. Really? Do you understand what I'm saying about Noah? Noah was confronted. He had to confront his reality was, this is what's going on. This is what's going to happen. This is what God requires for me to do. So he started building an ark. Can you imagine what the neighbors were thinking about this man? What are you building that for? And you, what are you doing? What were the animals? Do you understand? And, and you think you got? You think you have a problem? Think about Noah. Think about Abraham. Think about anybody that made a difference in their life. They were confronted with the reality, and they required for them to do something that was way beyond what they signed up for. Yeah. But it was within the the remit of God to take them and bring them to a place of their potential, their purpose, their potential, and their prosperity. So, you know, and, and here's one of the things that I hate these things that when people say, you can hear when somebody's not willing to face their reality. They talk about the good, old, they were not good. How many of you know the good old days were not good? Maybe our morals were greater back then than they are today, but I quite enjoy the technology we used to today. I would hate to get on an ox cart and travel by ox cart through wild country to forage, to forage a life. How many of you know it's nice jumping into the new wagon here and driving down a, a highway and get to the destination where I want to go? Amen. Amen? 
I, I, the, the thought of sitting on a boat for six weeks as it goes from America to England is a nightmare for me. That's why you're one of the things, Michelle, they say, well, can we go on, can we go on a cruise? I said, I feel like a trapped rat on a cruise. Sorry, I know some of you people enjoy the whole cruise thing, but that's how I feel because I want to know that I can go. Anyway, but, you know, because of love, I will grow in that area. Amen. I'll grow in that area. Well, Seth, thank you. Thank you, Seth. You, you're hired. Boom, you got the job. You understand? So just the thought of traveling for six weeks and then the storms and in those days, can you imagine John Wesley coming to America on a little dinghy boat and the things going and then the waves came and everybody was freaking out and the Moravians were having a, a prayer meeting. And he thought, man, these guys have got something I don't have. He faced his reality and said, I need what they have. And he was supposed to become here to minister. Anyway, so there's nothing good about the good old days. How many of you know that? You, you now have a, a, a phone that is completely got everything on that you need to know where to go, uh, what your appointments are. If you are searching for anything, you have a friend in Surrey. <laughs> Amen. The, the old days, you had to go into a library and go and search for an encyclopedia to find out something historical. Now you just say, hey, Surrey. What I did the other day, hey, Siri, what's the temperature? What is 97 degrees Fahrenheit and centigrade? Because we know centigrades. And I said, that's 37 centigrades. Man, that's hot. hot. You know, but 97 Fahrenheit means 97. <laughs> it's kind of hot out here. Anyway. <laughs> so change requires Courage. How many of you know that? It, it requires courage. It requires you to break free from your comfort zone. And that's the biggest problem that we have because we are creatures of comfort. We create this little environment and then we sit in this little environment and we create that comfort and then when something requires of us to move, we resist it. And so it takes courage. And that's what he said to Joshua in Joshua 1, 8 and 9. And he says, this book of the law will not depart. But he says, but now you have courage where you, I'm taking you. You're going to need the courage. And the courage was not because of the enemy. Because God says, I will defeat them for you. The courage was the willingness to want to change from your present environment to, go, to step into your future where God wants you to be. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. I remember Kyle and Rachel about Bible school. They had to have courage to confront and, and, and believe God. There were resources, there were finances issues, there was all kinds of stuff. There was talking in tongues issues and everything else. <laughs> yeah, but I admire them because they faced their reality and took the plunge and, and dealt with those things. Yeah. Hey Amen. Are you better off today? Oh, yes. Wasn't you happy that you took the, plunge. took the plunge? Isn't your life better today? Don't you love each other more today? Don't you have a better relationship with God today? Isn't it all that better? But don't get too comfortable. God's got other things. Just saying. It's like I said to Robin this morning. I believe she had a prophetic word. Next time I'm just going to drag it. I said, Robin, come and prophesy. Yeah, give the microphone. I thought, I thought, I because sometimes we get comfortable in our... Do you understand? We Listen, God wants the gifts to operate in our church. But so often we, 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 we hang back. Because it requires the courage to step out and say, what if it's wrong? What if it's right? What if it's right? What if somebody needed that word in season and you're holding back? And that's the courage that you need to do, that to confront that, that intimidation, that fear, and say, no, hang on a second. I'm going to renew my mind to what is the good and perfect and what is the good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. I'm going to step out in faith because I know God's prompting me and He's moving me, and I'm going to move forward with what God's got planned for me. Amen. Amen? And so it means fighting through the comfort zone, disciplining what is holding you back, and enduring the pain to obtain the change that is necessary. You know, when, we, when, I, when I left, when, when the church where I was at, when we've completed Bible school, they offered me a post in the, in, in the Bible school. 
And, um, and I believe it, and I knew it was God. And, and they said, but you've got to understand, this is all we can pay you. Yeah. And so I said, okay. I believe God's called me. I'm going to step into that. Amen. And so I resigned my job. It was a high, it was, a, I was a, the, the, I was the assistant managing director. My father-in-law was the managing director. Two motor cars, expense account, nice salary, comfortable living, everything else. And now we have to give up that and step into what we believe God's got for us. The salary was about a third of what I was getting. But that's all they could offer to pay me. Now, either you believe that God's called you and He's positioned you and He's placed you, otherwise don't accept it. And so we believed it, but, you know, two months into the whole situation, and th- th- we, we just ran out of every bit of money that we had because I had to give back the motor cars, and so I had to believe God for a motor car, and we got this little green, little green golf <laughs> The little green golf that in cold weather we had to push, we had to push it down the road to get the, uh, the glow plugs working because it was diesel so that we could ride. Hello? And here's this man with prosperity and power. And, you know, we're running down the road with my suit on a, Sunday, on a Monday morning, you know, getting ready for college, pushing this little car down the road. She knows. She, was, she went to Christian school. And so a few months in, I began to whine. I began to whinge and whine. I, Lord, how come? And, you know, you know. And then I started bad mouthing the church. And then the Holy Spirit jerked the slack out of me. The Holy Spirit said, "When you took the job, did you accept the the money that they were willing to pay you?" I said, "Yes." Did you not say, and the Holy Spirit reminded, did you not say God will take care of you? Yeah? So why are you now bad-mouthing them on the basis of your situation? Maybe your reality is you trust in man more than you trust in me. This is the Holy Spirit talking to me. So I have these conversations. I said, oops. Repented, immediately repented. Man is not my source. God is my source. It was about two months later, God gave me that invention. The invention turned everything around. I was in, eventually employed 11 people in a, in a business that was making um, a valves for the plumbing industry. Put, I don't know how many students through Bible school. Investing in people's lives. Do you understand? But it took that moment to face that reality and that change to see man is not my source of supply. God is. But it took courage then to trust God and believe God and bring about that change in our life. Amen? You see, Jesus had to endure the cross to experience the joy of the resurrection. And in the resurrection, he became the first fruit of all believers who confess Him as Savior. Do you understand? And so sometimes the pain that we have to confront is for the benefit of so many that are following on. Are you guys getting anything? So we have to face reality, have the courage, willing to make the decision, willing to want to change, and willing to step into what God has for our, for, for our life. Yeah. Amen? And again... Yeah, number five, and we'll go home, because my, my grandson said to me, he said, Papa, you only got 20 minutes to preach. I said, no, 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 i got more. He says, no, the, the Sunday nights, are they not an hour long? I said, no, we're not like the ad- average church. We don't do an hour service. Uh, we do until Papa's finished preaching. He says, I hope it won't be long. <laughs> That's a good, they live such a busy life. <laughs> what did I tell you when your grandkids come into your life? They bring about change. Oh, man. Jeez. They remind you of the words you spoke. You said, Papa. I did. Oh, I, I, and I know I wasn't drunk, uh, I, but I'm sure. Anyway. So here's the thing that brings us all down. Because God wants, God wants you to change. How many of you know? He wants, he wants to you to change your position from a, from a substitute to being authentic. Because a lot of us live our life as substitutes. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Amen? God wants us to be authentic. 
And so what we do is we conform to our culture. We conform to the things around about us. Notice what it says. Do not be con to this, but be by the renewing of your mind what is the good, acceptable, and perfect will. And so what happens is that we, we are conformed. So we, 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 our position is one of substitute. We substitute the things around about us, as, but God says, I want to make you authentic. And it's a little bit like the church. The church needs to exchange its position from being a substitute to being authentic. From personality to purpose and potential. Hello? Because your change affects this change. This change affects the society's change. If you're not changing, nothing's going to change out there. Do you understand? If you're not willing to overcome your comfort zone and the things that are holding you captive, we can never see the change in our society. A change begins with us, begins internally with us, and then we change in our environment of our church, and then the church changes the environment of our community, and we change the environment of our country. But it begins with each one of us confronting our reality and confronting and saying, you know what, life could, I could be doing a lot better in life. How many people, we keep putting things off for, I'll get to it, I'll get to it. Yeah. Amen. We keep putting it off. Stop putting it off and start doing it. And so, one of the things that, um, that we need to really work on is our indifference to change. You see... Indifference means I see no need for, rather from indifference to inspiration to want to change. You know, if you're, if you're not willing to want to change, well, how can I grow better? What can I do better? How can I apply this thing better? What can I, how can I make a difference in this situation, in that, in that person's life? Do you understand? But because a lot of times we are indifferent to change. Well, you know, we've always done it this way. You know, what do they say? The, the, the seven dying word, uh, seven word, last words of a dying church. We've never done it this way or that way. I don't know how many words that is, but you can work it out. No. <laughs> Do you understand? And so God continually wants to change. You know, it was just lovely talking to a young couple this morning. And they said, you know, that, that they hated the prosperity message until COVID. So some good things came out of COVID because suddenly they were stuck at home and their resources amazing how quickly you start listening and they got on to Rodney Howard Brown and then they got on to Jonathan Shuttleworth and then they started getting understanding about that God, the whole essence of God is about your potential and your prosperity, your purpose, your potential and your prosperity. Now today, they're fully convinced. But it took them going through a difficult time, facing the reality, realizing that their money is running out, realizing that this thing that is now controlling their life is not the way that they want to do life. And so they began to change their reality. But it took courage. Amen. You understand? It was the same with us. You know, we grew up in, in a traditional church and, and the, the church believed that as long as, you, you know, God will keep you, you know, as long as you... How did, it, how did they put it? Lord, uh, uh, you keep him poor and we'll keep him humble. That kind of mentality. God doesn't want... Keep him humble, we'll keep him humble. Yeah, you keep him humble, we'll keep him poor. In other words, that there... And, and the biggest restriction is, is while you have that mentality, you, you're not a benefit to anybody. That's right. You're just barely making ends meet. Yeah. I said, I don't want to barely make ends meet. I want to be able to prosper and empower other people to do life. And teach them how to do life. And that's what God did for us. And he empowered us to do that. Do you understand? But we had a break. I got really angry when I first learned the principles of God's word. And said, you know, people have been robbing me all these years. The devil had lied to me through the church about my, my prosperity. Amen. In the same way about my healing and health. Hello? Yeah, Am I getting through? You've got to face the reality. You know, so often people, people take and they talk about their disease and, and they own it. 
So like I said to my, my one grandson, he said, you know, since I've come to my America, uh, you know, I have, uh, what's that when you get your nose blocked up? Allergies. Huh? Allergies. I said, no, I bind those words in Jesus' name. You don't have allergies, not that. You just because you've got a runny nose doesn't mean you have allergy. Don't take ownership of it. Do you understand? We take ownership. My, you know, my cancer, my diabetes. Well, happy birthday. I hope you're enjoying it. <laughs> I, I don't mean to be cruel, but the, the re, the, until you're willing. No, my reality is. <laughs> sorry. Sorry, Zach. I will behave myself. Anyway, the reality is God wants healing. But you've got to be willing to take hold of that reality and say, this is not God's best for my life. This is not how I'm going to live. This is I'm going to take charge over this thing right now in Jesus' name, and I'm going to believe God that God's going to do what He needs to do to bring about change in my body. Amen? Amen? And then begin to put into practice. You know, one of the things that God said back to me in 2007, I shared it with you. 2007, I was this size. And God said, if you don't change, you will not see the fulfillment of your destiny. I love food, <laughs> but food was killing me. Well, you're digging your grave with your mouth. I was digging my grave. With, you don't have to say it with such joy. <laughs> you're digging your grave. <laughs> you're digging. Because anything, that was anything that was food and sweet and sugar, it went in. And, and here's the illusion of the whole thing is that when I got up to preach, the anointing hit me, I felt like a thousand, a strong army. And then when I got off the platform and the anointing hit and left me, it felt like somebody had run over me with a truck. Never slept lying flat, always slept like this because the, the, the regurgitation that used to choke me at night and I used to wake up coughing and choking. Do you understand? But I, the next cake... Happy birthday. I just, the whole night before, I wrestled. I chewed my pillow, flowers. There were feathers all over the bedroom. And the next day, a big cake comes. Ah! <laughs> Do I understand? I love Kit Kats. And the church said, oh, pastor loves Kit Kat. They used to buy me boxes of Kit Kat. I said, you know, and eventually I think, I was my own worst enemy. I would tell people what I like, and because people love you, they'll kill you. I mean, they will give you. <laughs> anyway, but in 2007, I made a decision. Food is not my comfort. Food is my medicine. So I must only put into this body what is going to heal it. Amen? Amen. And that's what I began to do. I only put into this body what's going to heal me and keep me. Now with my grandkids around, I'm going to have to work harder. <laughs> I'm going to have to work harder. And of course, his, his birthday is on the 4th of July. And, and, uh, and, and he's got the whole pancake planned up and everything. I'm thinking, oh my word. There we go again. Anyway, but I'm facing reality. It's just his birthday, and it's just once in a year, and I'm sure I can endure that for <laughs> But do you understand? And it required change, and it was hard, because I had to change the way I thought. I had to change the way I did things, but I, I had to confront my reality. My reality is, if you don't change, you're dying prematurely. I didn't want to die prematurely. I wanted to fulfill my destiny. I wanted to be able to stand before God and, and him say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. I didn't want to stand before him and say, you're up here pretty early. I had all these other things planned for you and you didn't do them. There's this wonderful church that is in Needville just waiting for you and you missed the boat. What's wrong with you? Huh? Huh? You could have missed Texas. You're right, I could have missed Texas. Anyway. Get our barbecue. No. <laughs> Vegetables. <laughs> mm. Salads. Salads and more salads. So I feel like a rabbit already. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> anyway, I hope you got something out of that tonight. 
uh, help you. That, you know, there is a need for change. What is the thing that you are, is, is confronting you in your life that needs that change? It could be spiritual. It could be physical. It could be emotional. It could be relational. It could be uh, mental. You need to be serious. You need to look at yourself and say, that thing needs to change. What am I prepared to do about it? And the first thing that you do is you go to God and you say, God, I see this thing. I recognize it. Help me. And of course, the Holy Spirit will come in and it will help you. It will empower you and give you the wisdom. And when he gives you the wisdom, don't just sit there and look at it. Begin to take that wisdom and apply it in your life and bring about the change that God wants to see happen in your life. And then begin to live the dream. I say live the dream. Today we live the dream. Michelle and I live the dream. We we love being in Texas. We love our home. We love the things that we're doing. We love our church. We love everything else that God has brought into our life. Amen. Amen. So what is it? Just, just take a minute and say, what is the one thing that you've been putting off that you know you need to do? Just the one thing. Start with that one thing. Notice, God didn't do everything in one day. The first thing he did was separate the chaos from the order. If there is disorder in your life, maybe that's where you must begin. Bring about the reality and say, you know what? I've let that thing go too far. You know, because sometimes we say, you know, I've got to get to my garage. I've got to tighten. No, no, I'm not talking about you, Dennis. I'm talking about me now. Me, me, please. I've got to do my garage because, and then, don't just keep putting it off. Go do it. Just walk in there and, and begin to create the order. Once you've done that, it's amazing how the next thing God begins to work on you. You see, we, you, you, when you're cleaning a house, you don't do the whole house at the same time. You do one bedroom or one room at a time. And as you do that, by the time you get to the end, you feel so good because you've changed everything in, the, in your environment and you've put order in there. Yeah. But just start where you are. Just start with the one thing. Face that reality. Take courage and say, I'm willing, I'm going to be willing to take the, the bull by the horns, as you call them, yeah, bull by the horns, and I'm going to confront that thing and I'm going to bring about that change. So many people say, how do you get up every morning and do the devotion? I face my reality. My reality is I'd love to sleep an extra five hours. <laughs> but if I do that, my discipline in my life is going to go out the windows. And if my discipline goes out my windows, then my moral... Uh, uh, at my moral um, huh? Yeah, my moral compass will begin to wane because then I'm tending to the flesh and not to the spirit. And let me tell you, when that gets out of hand, you don't want to know me. Ask Michelle. She sends me very often. You need a quiet time. Go back into your study. <laughs> you understand? So the discipline of confronting, putting that in, facing that, and if that's something that you need to do, then you need to push that into into order and begin to do that and say, you know what, I'm going to give my first hour of every day to God. I'm not going to think about anything else. I'm going to take that first hour I'm going to give it to God. Let me tell you, when you begin to bring that discipline, everything else begins to change in your life. Yeah. Amen. Anyway, I hope this has been helpful to you today. The need for change. There is, listen. Yeah, it, change is here to stay. You understand? And, and it's a constant thing, constantly growing, constantly putting into order and constantly growing in the things of God. Amen. Father, we love you. We are grateful again tonight. Always for your word. Do not be conformed. We don't want to be conformed to our comfort zone. We don't want to be conformed to the things that the world tells us that we can have or should have or could have. But we want to be transformed by the renewing of our minds. What is the good, acceptable and perfect will of our God? perfect will of our Father, to step into the fullness of what you've purposed and planned. 
For, Father, you have created us with purpose. You created us with a potential. And in that potential, you created us with the ability to prosper, to thrive, to flourish, to subdue, to have dominion. And so again tonight, we thank you, Lord, that you who have begun this good work continually challenges us to grow more and more into the image and likeness of your Son. So we thank you, Lord, once again for the wisdom of your word. We thank you for the examples that your word has given us and how they confronted their reality and dealt with the things that you had for them, the potential. Even thinking about Joshua going into the promised land. Lord, there were things that were confronting him that he needed to push through and break through those barriers of that mentality that where people were fearful and stayed out of their inheritance for 40 years. And Lord, the, the new generation pushed in, faced the reality and took control of those things and then conquered their land and took hold of that promise which you gave them. And so, Father, once again, we are just take, we face the reality of the things that are things that have, we have put aside and we put off and we continually put one side and we say, Lord, today is the day that we take that thing. We confront it and we take authority over it and we begin to deal with it in Jesus' name. And Father, I thank you that every person here tonight, Lord, will be deal with. The most important one is the change to become spiritually identified with your Son and in your Son. May we grow spiritually, Lord, to the fullness of all that you have purposed and planned in Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah. God bless you. God, uh, don't forget Wednesday night we've got Bible study, 7 to 8. I'm busy going to run on with um, from last week. Last week we were talking about the, um, the first fruits and how um, and Joshua, when he entered the first fruits of everything and how they didn't honor God, someone didn't honor God and it affected them. And so I'm going to teach more on that line about the first fruits, the tithe, the offerings. So if you want to know more about that, I would encourage you to come to